Hello everyone, welcome to another edition of the Orthodox Nationalist. Today is July 17th, 2016, which makes it the 98th anniversary of the murder of the Russian royal family. And um, Tsar Nicholas and Alexandra, as well as the murder itself, is going to be the subject of uh, this, this radio broadcast. I have dealt with Tsar Nicholas many times in the past. I've dealt with him in more than one book and, and, and many essays uh, of mine. In my view, as many of you know, he is one of the great men of the uh, 20th century. And like all great men, he is slandered and uh, verbally assaulted on a daily basis. Most of what the average American, the average European, thinks about history and politics is completely wrong. And I've come to the conclusion that even, even now, that we aren't even speaking the same language when we talk about these kind of things. A fruitful conversation with somebody, kind of an ordinary uh, person, uh, not of the nationalist or, or the orthodox world, is uh, really, really fruitless. And, and it's been a long time since there have been actually a, a useful conversation with, with someone. And that's largely because, uh, even with the best of intentions, we're not speaking the same language. We're not using words in the same way. And our assumptions are not the same. Almost every single thing about every single event that's significant in American or European history, the average American university professor, high school teacher, the average American citizen has completely wrong. And that leads to completely different personalities and completely different lifestyles. And Tsar Nicholas II is one of them, uh, one of the most important ones. Tsar Nicholas II was technically the last Roman emperor because he comes from the East Roman line going back to Constantine and more than one um, uh, Grand Duke of, of, um, of, uh, of Kiev and then Moscow uh, married into the Byzantine royal family. And he was the last um, functional uh, Christian empire. Now there were Christian states. Bulgaria and Serbia that were struggling at the time after the Balkan Wars, but the only empire that was Orthodox, the defender of the Orthodox world, was Russia, and Tsar Nicholas was at the head of it. You know from this show and from my own writings, the 18th century saw the royal family, so-called royal families, persecuting the Orthodox Church just as bad as it did uh, in the 20th century under the Bolsheviks. They simply didn't have the bureaucratic mechanisms that people like Stalin had. Um, so the 19th century was about rebuilding this church, rebuilding the Russian way of life. Most of the uh, people who were claiming to be emperor in the 18th century were not Russian, were not Orthodox. Um, you know, there were, you know, Peter I was a Freemason, which means he could not be an Orthodox man and therefore cannot be a monarch. Um, same thing for um, Peter the third, same thing for Catherine the second. So what we want to do today is we'll talk about the political vision of Tsar Nicholas, his accomplishments and victories uh, during his reign, and then the murder itself, which is completely misunderstood. It was a ritual killing. The house in which, in which they were killed uh, was scrawled on the wall, many uh, very mysterious things that to the average person may, means nothing. But to someone who can recognize the symbols, it means quite a bit. It was a Jewish ritual murder overseen by a rabbi. And there's actually some very striking evidence. Um, the, the Kahal had, uh, in, in the major Kahal in Brooklyn, had declared a death penalty for Tsar Nicholas in 1905. And you'll see uh, where this uh, radio show has been posted. I also have a picture of the um, postcard that was uh, printed up by the by this kahal and the Jewish elite in uh, Brooklyn, New York at the time. Uh, one showing um, the sacrificial uh, chicken uh, over the head of the, the rabbi, uh, which is done for the times of, of sacrifice with the head of um, Tsar Nicholas on it. And the second pro postcard is from France that says Holy Russia in French coming from a, a, um, a Jewish Masonic Lodge and Tsar Nicholas's head on a pike. 
or both of these are from 1905 and show that, that the Jews uh, wanted him dead. Uh, the Jews' antitype, the Jewish antitype is Rome. Rome is condemned uh, over and over in the Talmud. And Nicholas, not only being the last Christian emperor, but also the last Roman emperor. And even more than that, being a very successful emperor, personally a very good man, he is, he is the worst enemy of the, of the Jewish elite at the time, the banking elite at the time. Most of you realize that Tsar Nicholas had refused, although he was offered many times, to turn the ruble over to um, Jewish bankers from Western Europe. One of the reasons that he was sentenced to death was his refusal to hand over the Russian economy. Part of the reason for this is that Tsar Nicholas was very well aware of the Jewish mentality and how much they hated him and Russia and Rome, not to mention Christianity. But also that Russia was very close to being completely self-sufficient. It required nothing. Its trade with the outside world was really only in um, grain, where uh, the country was feeding the world by 1914. The population was growing massively. Oil was discovered in the Caucasus. Siberia was being settled by Russian peasants, where they were taking huge areas of land for free, along with free tools and transportation, to become not only landowners, but major landowners. With the population growing to that extent, um, had World War I not occurred, uh, the entire Russian landmass would have been colonized, and Russia would be by far the largest um, ethnic group in the world. There would have been no Hitler, there would have been no Stalin, there would have been uh, no FDR. The world would be completely different. It would probably be a completely orthodox world. And um, But this is the reason why uh, Tsar Nicholas needed to go. The British Empire um, was threatened by two things. She was threatened, first of all, by the incredible rise of Germany, first by Prussia, and then after 1871, Germany, and the second, even more so, by Russia. And both of these countries were growing immensely in terms of the economy, as well as basic social justice. They were more or less equalitarian societies, especially when compared to the U.S. or Great Britain. Therefore, they were a huge threat to the British Empire. And this is, the, this is why the British had financed the Japanese Navy and started the Russo-Japanese War. Now, the key in the British mind at the time was to figure out a way to get Russia and Germany to fight one another. Both of those countries um, could have defeated Great Britain in a simple one-on-one -on -one combat. Uh, both together would have ended the British Empire for good. And so um, the short version of the story is that they used the Balkans to draw Vienna into a conflict against Russia. And since um, Vienna and Berlin were connected, it would have led to um, Russia and Germany fighting one another. And that was the British plan. It was the British plan because the empire was at stake and the profits were at stake. And it was so perfectly executed that it could only be of diabolical origin. Russia was never an ally of Great Britain. Um, they may have been on the same side in the history books, but the British loathed and despised Russia and was simply bleeding her dry, the purpose being to have Russia and Germany uh, destroy one another, even though the two countries had quite a bit in common, far more in common than they did in any kind of difference. Nicholas II, as a monarch, his political theory is, is fairly easy to understand. Um, first of all, he hated the bureaucracy. There's a big difference between the crown, the orthodox crown, and the orthodox state. The state was a problem because the state refers to the bureaucracy, the mechanisms of power. They always stood in the way of Nicholas or the monarch and the people. Nicholas and most of the monarchs in 19th century Russia were popular. They were very popular and it was very common for the common folk to say that it is the nobility or the bureaucracy that stands in the way of um, Russian progress. And this is very true. For example, Tsar Nicholas wanted to eradicate vodka introduced in the 18th century 
from the Russian mentality. A sizable portion, maybe 20% of the budget, came from vodka sales. And he had uh, various plans about how this was slowly to be sure to be stamped out. The church was heavily involved in temperance campaigns at the time and despised the, the Russian penchant for, for vodka. But at each and every step of the way, the bureaucratic nobility stopped him. They refused to enforce decrees. They infused, refused to make anything work. And Tsar Nicholas, you know, called an absolute monarch, which is laughable, um, was stymied at every turn. Needless to say, there's no such thing as an absolute monarch ever. It simply can't be done. Number one, the mechanisms of power were not as advanced as you had in the 20th century. So absolutism is simply impossible just in the, for the lack of ability to enforce law. Number two, certainly in Russia, it was too difficult for St. Petersburg to communicate with the rest of the country. It took a very long time to get from one place to another, especially in the springtime. So to function as an absolute ruler was, was absolutely impossible for that reason. And thirdly, remember, the Charter of the Nobility under Catherine II gave a completely set of, a different set of laws for the nobility, removing them to a great extent from royal jurisdiction. Um, but even dis despite that, the nobility, um, although you know under law and free of royal control, were slowly disappearing. They were not um, a significant force by 1900. You can achieve nobility through government service, but that's not what I mean. I'm talking about um, actual aristocrats from the past and this handing down from father to son. That, that section of the nobility was simply disappearing. The crown, not the state, the crown was the foundation of the government, was the foundation of rule, again, not the state. Government, law, constitution. These are part of the crown, these are part of the church, part of the history and tradition of a people. The state is another matter. The state refers to the bureaucracy, who did far more harm than good, did not enforce the law, would not enforce the law if it came against their interests. And there was simply no one, given the fact that the Tsars were extremely scrupulous in their obedience to the law, could do very little about it. In fact, Tsar Nicholas I had created his secret chancellor. The point being was to find corruption and problem in the bureaucracy, to be able to rule directly, rather than having to go through these very powerful, often very wealthy, noble clans in St. Petersburg. Rule comes from the crown and the people within and under the church, that is the constitution. For Tsar Nicholas, Russia was the creation of the church. That is the Orthodox world from both Byzantium and Bulgaria created the Russian identity, created the Russian form of government, created the Russian law, and created peasant customs. And this is all true. Without orthodoxy, there would be no Russia whatsoever. There would be no literacy. There would be no written word with wherever the um, church went, it brought literacy to so much of us, from whether it be the biblical books or the canons, um, saints' lives, whatever, it was a very literate religion. Um, when Tsar Nicholas, by the beginning of the war, had almost stamped out poverty completely, and had almost stamped out illiteracy completely. And he was getting very close to stamping out uh, alcoholism as well. And given the massive number of hospitals, nursing schools, medical schools that he had established quite often with his own money. And that was very blurry, which was state money, which is his own personal money. Um, even things like childhood diseases um, were being eradicated. Russia was progressing such a rapid pace in every area of life so quickly that the British, the British Freemasons, the Jewish Kahals were panicking and they were openly panicking. Add to that the growth of the German monarchy and the growth of that economy. British elites in London were almost in a state of stupor. They had simply passed uh, the area of, of panic completely. The reign of Nicholas II is largely one success after another. Now, I'm not a big believer in uh, industrialization, and neither was Nicholas. The agrarian life is the standard. However, however, it's absolutely necessary 
for industry to exist, to be able to keep up with other nations, be able to defend itself, be able to build a rational economy. It doesn't need to be entirely dedicated to industry, however. Russia was largely an agrarian nation, but you had iron and steel increasing almost 200% between 1900 and 1913. And the pig iron or the unprocessed iron increased by 100% in the same in the same area. By the time the war broke out, about 90% of the land was in peasant hands, either individually or within the commune. In Germany at the time, the figure was about 40%. Their foreign trade increased by about 150%, and this was not just uh, in the grain trade, although that was overwhelmingly what it was, but also in terms of industry. The old nobility was disappearing. The noble class had gone over to liberalism um, throughout the 19th century. Most of the real nobility were deep in debt. But this rising peasant class, uh, urban merchants, usually the old believer, as well as those in government service, had completely rendered the old nobility um, obsolete. And that's a very good thing for Russia. The old nobility had largely destroyed uh, much of the orthodox uh, uh, moral fabric, at least in their own households. And the working class, by 1900, was still very small. But peasants were the landlord class, some of them growing uh, quite wealthy. But by the end of the reign of Alexander II, this rising industry, actually Alexander III, pardon me, his father, um, it was very difficult to fire workers. Hours, hours were reduced and night hours were forbidden for all but emergency situations. And the most important thing that he did was the factory inspector. Government inspectors were sent into every major factory in the empire. They had their own courts where they were able to hear labor complaints. Retaliation was completely forbidden. And they reported back directly to the monarch in terms of, um, in terms of working conditions. As some of you know, Russian taxes were by far the lowest in Europe, even though the, the government um, ran a, a, um, a debit balance or a surplus um, in its budget, they were roughly uh, 1.83, almost two rubles per capita. Uh, using the ruble standard at the time, this is about 17 rubles in Great Britain. Western Europe was well, maybe 15 times the tax rate of, of Russia. And remember too, at the same time in the United States, this is when the robber barons were crushing unions and creating the infamous um, oligarchy that continues to rule America. 1913 was when the Federal Reserve was created, and so the U.S. became a regime entirely dominated by bankers. This is something near the end of Wood, uh, Wilson's life. He admits saying that he has inadvertently destroyed the legal fabric of the United States. Now, even Soviet estimates under Stalin and afterwards, Soviet era estimates of peasant land ownership under Nicholas II put the figure at 90.45 of the land owned by the peasantry. A lot of this is because nobility had been very corrupt. They had abandoned orthodoxy, they had abandoned nationalism, and because of their massive debts, they were very eager to sell. Furthermore, the redemption payments were the payments when Alexander II liberated the serfs, affecting maybe 30% of the Russian peasantry, maybe 40%. Um, they had to pay, they had to compensate. The state immediately compensated landowners for their land, and the peasants had to, in installments over time, pay back the state. This was canceled under Alexander III. So a very brief time afterwards, all of their debts were canceled. In liberal democracy, that is impossible. Those who are um, ranchers in the old Russian Empire, their herds grew by um, about 200%. Butter production and dairy farms grew over 300% between 1900 and 1913. Uh, fresh salted meats in terms of domestic uh, consumption as well as exports 
grew by about 500% in this 13-year period. Russia grew, at the time World War I breaks out, Russia grows 60% of the world's rye and about 30% of its oats. Part of the reason for this is the increasing number of peasant landowners to the point where, thanks to Vita and some of his uh, reforms uh, in terms of peasant land ownership, allowing interest-free loans or very low uh, interest loans, many of these were canceled. Debts were eventually canceled uh, just prior to the war. That began in the era of Tsar Alexander III. It was very easy to become a landowner if you were a peasant. And this from, was from the peasant land bank, so it was aimed only at that peasant class. The government also financed local schools at the county level, the Zemspa level, and these were engaged in um, increasing yields through methods and fertilizers and introducing certain kinds of machinery. Not only was Russia running a, a large budget surplus, but she was running a trade surplus. So she was not a debtor nation at all. She was a, a creditor nation. Oil, steel, and then sugar beets uh, from Ukraine. This was a big export of hers. All of her sugar came from beets rather than uh, sugar cane like you would have growing in Hawaii or Cuba. Um, the debts that she had, which were very easily paid off, were France because some of her industrial imports came from the French. Although France herself, not a major industrial power at the time. Keep in mind as well, when someone talks about the absolutism of the czars, uh, you should laugh. You should chuckle condescendingly because almost all government positions under the federal level were elected. Federal government positions in St. Petersburg were almost completely irrelevant to the average peasant or the average townsman. The main form of government for the peasants was a commune. This had grown greatly in sophistication. And you had 90% literacy by the outbreak of World War I. So you had regular uh, records being kept. I mean, the average American historian would love you to believe that these were just free-for-alls. You know, they claimed to, to condemn the Russian Empire for its lack of democracy. And then when it looks at peasant democracy at the local level, they condemn that because it was just a, a, a fistfight. So they can't win. Uh, Russia simply can't win with these people. But that's the price of tenure, I suppose, in history departments these days. But the commune had all of its, uh, had, was completely elected every member. Uh, they had its own police force. It had its own uh, court system. All, including every police officer, was elected. Now the Volost, basically the county level, the Zemsvid level, uh, these were units of local government, uh, all also elected with two houses, a noble uh, section and then a commoner section. The nobles dominated the upper house and peasants dominated the lower house. And sometimes both um, Zemsva um, heads and commune, commune heads would send their um, their grievances to uh, either the federal or the governor level. Gov government, um, the governors of the regions were appointed. Um, however, governors of the different regions, though appointed from St. Petersburg, could do very little without the consent of the Volost or the commune uh, leadership. This has to be made very, very clear. Given the small, you know, the, the Russian bureaucracy was tiny. There were more bureaucrats in absolute numbers in Paris in 1914 than in the entire um, St. Petersburg Federal Empire. That was as in absolute terms. Russian bureaucracy, contrary to popular belief, was very, very small. One of the reasons the taxes were so low. And therefore, a governor, which was just right under the federal level in terms of, of significance, could not depend on St. Petersburg for getting his work done. It had to be with the consent of local bodies. And furthermore, any federal law, any law coming from St. Petersburg could be negated. There was an act, absolute, like a, um, a form of jury nullification. You have this at the Volos level. You also have this at the commune level. The nobility, as I said before, although disappearing, they were not under the jurisdiction of the monarch. They had given, they had given their freedom under Peter III, uh, Catherine II, and then um, Paul. And they had full civil rights, despite the fact that they had long abandoned their loyalty to the empire. Um, but 
uh, their, their relevance in terms of economics was simply disappearing. Uh, there was a new noble class that was coming uh, both in terms of present, uh, peasant land ownership um, as well as those who were earning nobility and the status of nobility uh, from government service. And even more, the church, although having been persecuted by the so-called monarchs of the 18th century, was undergoing a massive revival. Um, the rise of Altina showed a revival of the hesychastic idea. People like John of Kronstadt. Uh, and then the monastery of Sarov. Uh, you had a massive growth in new converts. You had a new, uh, including you know, non-Russian peoples. Though there was never any forced conversions. Um, you had a massive growth of conversion. People who had been kind of cold towards the church before were coming back. Church had been given new life. It was deeply royalist, far more so than the nobles and the bureaucracy. It hated uh, alcoholism and, and vodka sales and did everything in its power to stop them. And by 1900, you had this huge crop of new intellectual theologians that were challenging uh, the West uh, on, its, on its own turf. Simply put, there is no area of Russian life that was not monstrously, massively improving by the time World War I breaks out in 1914. Every way you can measure a country's standard of living, however you might measure that, Russia was improving rapidly. The same could be said for Germany, not quite as much. No one had the level of uh, peasant land ownership as you had in Russia. The United States was already an oligarchy in its early stages as was Great Britain. They'll spend the rest of the 20th century perfecting their oligarchical system. Great Britain is extremely threatened by both countries, but Russia especially. Not only were they showing that the free market was not necessary for industrial growth, that cooperation rather than competition could be used if it had its cultural foundation and it was showing growth and an equalitarian growth. It wasn't just, it didn't benefit just a handful of people. In fact, if they had a Gini index back then, it would show Russia to be relatively uh, fairly equal compared to what was going on in the U.S. or Great Britain. But even Germany, at 40% peasant land ownership, even that was very impressive because you have university professors, believe it or not, that will tell you today that in Russia it, was, it wasn't possible for peasants to own land. And some of them will tell you that the commune wasn't really land ownership because it was owned by the commune rather than the individual peasant. They just simply import corrupt American morals onto 19th century Russia and use that to condemn these people. The Russian peasants, when it was made possible for the commune to dissolve itself through peasants buying land in their own right, it didn't happen very much. The commune was a deep, very old part of the Russian psyche. It worked. It worked in good times, but more importantly, it worked in bad times. One of the most important aspects of the communal life, apart from that was completely elected, was that if someone fell on hard times, it was understood, and there was no legal sanction for this, it simply understood that those that were doing better assisted the person who was struggling. A widow, say her husband gets killed in, say, in, the, in, the, um, in the war in Crimea, for example, is taken care of. Now that was, had a legal sanction attached to it, but on harvest time, for example, the young man of the commune would always harvest her, her grain for her. And as people got older, it was understood that they still were economically viable, even if they needed a lot of help in gathering the grain harvest time, and then making sure that everything is stored properly. Poverty was almost totally unknown in the communal system. And since the bulk of the peasants belonged to the commune, having its debts canceled by both Alexander and Nicholas not only showed uh, monarchy superiority to liberal democracy, but it showed that poverty was largely a thing of the past. But both the peasants, uh, literate by the time the war breaks out, alcohol um, sales are dropping. 
Russia is one of the world's tremendous success stories in every area of its life. Russia was improving. Now, prior to World War I, Tsar Nicholas, as a young monarch, had developed a plan for Europe-wide disarmament. And usually in, in the history texts, either this is not brought up or they bring it up and show him as some kind of a starry-eyed idealist who had no idea how countries work. That's a stupid state. Those who don't bring it up know what it really was. Tsar Nicholas had developed a plan to control the application of science to weaponry. This is what was frightening him. And this is before World War I. Europe was not ready for the slaughter that things like the tank, the airplane, poison gas, machine guns, developments like the German Mauser, very accurate rifles, the damage that it could wreak on people, the millions of men that were killed, where in wars prior to this, a few thousand may be killed. And even that was considered terribly bloody. The concept of the European disarmament that Nicholas had proposed um, had a few, a few planks. Number one, he wanted there to be a European-wide review of all new developments and improvements in weapon systems. If something were to sort of have a dual use that could be partially civilian, partially military, something in the civilian realm that could be used as a weapon, this is what he wanted to be specifically reviewed before it would be permitted. Number two, more specifically, existing weapons. He wanted to ban all improvements to them. He wanted to see how much he could freeze weapons development. It was bad enough he had the machine gun, but he knew that over time it's going to get more and more accurate and be able to shoot more and more uh, rounds without overheating. And he wanted to ban all improvements to existing weapons. And this is to a great extent his limitation on working hours. He wanted um, all of Europe to adopt the factory legislation of his father, Alexander III, and keep an eight-hour working day so that the major weapons, um, you know, like the Krupp company in, in Germany, couldn't work both its, its white-collar and blue-collar labor into the ground. That the eight-hour day should be imposed and that labor should be directed not towards things like the machine gun, but things that actually help people rather than kill them. He also wanted to ban submarines as a weapon of war. They were too dangerous, and this is something that Britain should have taken him up on, because it was Germany's secret weapon. The submarines, uh, I guess, to, to the chivalrous mind, was kind of unfair. It wasn't really a fight, it wasn't really combat, because at the time there was no way to get to them. It was a sneak attack. He also was the first to develop the idea of having the International Court of Arbitration at The Hague. This came initially from Tsar Nicholas's turn of the century um, disarmament plan. It really wasn't a disarmament plan, it was an arms limitation plan that was ignored by all European leaders, of course. He also wanted to ban the use of poison gas and, importantly, banning the use of air power in warfare. Always struck me as strange that Hitler was supposed to have gassed all these people, and yet, why didn't he use poison gas on the Eastern Front? It's a question I don't think anyone else but, but me has asked. If you could ban poison gas, and that for the most part has been almost always a ban that's been maintained, then you could ban submarines and you could ban improvements on, on weaponry. Everything that he was predicting here came true. That if science, if science develops and technology develops, it's going to have more uh, negative effects than positive ones. He predicted what's going to happen in, in, in the water and on the air. As these, these developments become more and more sophisticated, they're going to be able to kill more and more people. And they'll be able to do so from a place that no one else can get to them. So high altitude bombing 
the most part, it's not exactly a chivalrous combat. It's just a way to slaughter people. There is no justification for that. There's no justification for an air war. For the most part, it's meant to slaughter civilians. And same thing for, for gas. These were the means that Tsar Nicholas had developed as a young monarch to, um, he saw World War I coming. He is one of the few that predicted that the use of um, the scientific technique as applied to weaponry is going to lead to the slaughter of millions and then tens of millions. Very few other people uh, were aware of this. Now, of course, at the time, no one took him seriously. Although the League of Nations were then later on, after the war, will, will steal his ideas. The League of Nations stole every word of Tsar Nicholas's um, disarmament plan and claimed it as their own. But at the time, uh, he was not taken seriously. But his prediction was that future wars are going to be unlike anything else in the past. That science, in terms of technology, applied science and technology, has a limited use, but it will cause more damage than it will help. And most of the things that it will help about are a problem that it caused in the first place. But warfare is about to change radically. In the diary of the Empress Alexandra, um, not a whole lot in there is of political import, but there are a few things that are worthy of note. And this is an excellent primary source. Um, first of all, the one thing that she says over and over again for both herself and her husband is that they believe that charity is the primary virtue. Without charity, every other virtue is nonsense. Every other virtue is just for show. Number two, urban poverty is becoming a problem. Industrialization and urbanization have been largely nothing but a problem. Um, despite the fact that it can produce some extraordinary things, poverty is being eradicated in urban areas, which is, of course, most of Russia and most of the world. Um, urban areas, when there's a rush to find these kind of jobs, um, the ties that you have with the land are being severed and traditions are dissolving. Workhouses for the poor were a major personal product of, of Alexandra, and most of her own money is going to this. Remember, the royal family had very little of their own money by the end of the war. They had spent almost everything of theirs. They, I keep hearing about the, the Tsar's fortune you know, being stolen or taken somewhere. Uh, I got news for them. This may have been the government uh, gold reserve, but their own personal fortune had long since been spent. Both Tsar Nicholas and Alexandria had spent their personal money on establishing hundreds of schools, uh, especially institutes, uh, medical and otherwise. Poor relief was a huge one. In the 18th century, uh, Peter I, all throughout, right up until Catherine II, had destroyed the church's ability to own land. The church owned very little land in 1914. That land had been secularized in the 18th century. There was some growth of monasteries, but even there, that were very closely watched by the state, unfortunately. And local nobility were always opposed to church-owning land. But the church had been completely secularized in the 18th century, so that old canard, the church and state owning, you know, being the biggest landowner, is, is absolute nonsense. Alexandra, um, especially when the war began, all of their money, the family money, was spent on equipping. They equipped finally nine full trains of equipment, both for uh, the Japanese war and World War I. Their personal fortune was gone by 1914. So anything you hear about their personal fortune is mythology. And they say it, Alexandra says it's right in her diary. She didn't mean this for anyone else to read. So it must be true. This is not a public document. And she's saying, I have very little disposable income and I don't care because our money is going to charity. And by charity, she's not talking about helping some poor guy, but creating an infrastructure where the entire country can be healed. She says that she's given all her money away. She has very little income of her own. Most of the new students, she created an institute for nursing, a surgical school, a bunch of medical schools. Most of the students there were being having the tuition paid by her. I should also note 
uh, during the war, uh, 1905 to some extent. But World War I broke out. Everything, of course, that Nicholas said was true, came, came to pass. Alexandra was extremely uh, put out by this. She worked herself ragged. She and her daughters took a quick two-month surgical course, a crash course to become an RN, uh, more, of a, more of an army medic than an actual RN. Two-month basic field surgery is what they were trained in, and a lot of civilians were taking these crash courses to go to the front. Throughout the war, right up until they were arrested, Alexandra's diary states that she slept very little. She went out without sleep for sometimes three days at a time when there was a major engagement and soldiers came in. By the end of 1914, she had developed a serious heart condition for this reason. The lack of sleep did damage to her kidneys, did damage to her heart. She had poisoned her own blood because she refused to sleep. Her work, her hours were nonstop. Her money was being spent on all of these projects. So by the time the war is, comes out, there is no Romanov family fortune. All of this has been paid. She was also involved in training uh, new, new recruits to the medical field. Many didn't even realize that she was the empress. She spoke and dressed and acted just like a normal person. She was not nobility. She was not royalty. And so it was very vicious when the, the press, both Gentile and Jewish owned in Russia, was showing her living in the lap of luxury um, pictures of her, drawings of her, um, you know, in a bathtub filled with diamonds. You know, this is what the royal family is doing. The riots that developed it throughout Russia during World War I were artificial. They were created by rumors that the press had planted. I've read hundreds of Russian language newspaper, so-called newspaper reports from the era, and it was nothing but slander. They made things up. There were no journalistic standards. And it was very hard for the average reader to know what's true and what's false. The big mistake, the huge mistake of the royal family is their refusal to work with royalist groups on the outside. Propaganda is vulgar. Propaganda is something that democratic politicians do. It was a bad word. So they wouldn't, they wouldn't do it. Even the Black Hundreds, that was an extremely popular. They had, they had uh, millions of members and the various leftist groups had a few thousand. Their papers sometimes were sh uh, closed by local, local governors and mayors. They came under attack by people like Vita. Um, the, the royalist newspapers have been down to it, have been dwindling. By the time the war breaks out, there were, I think, only eight in circulation. The leftist papers uh, were in the dozens and dozens and dozens. The riots, the unrest, this was created by completely false media reports. They refused to write on the fact that she was driving herself into an early grave by working with the wounded, and all her daughters were as well. Nicholas and Alexandra traveled all the time. The point of the travel was to find what needed to be changed, what needed to be fixed. A lot of the locals um, both at the county level and the governorships, were creating these Potemkin villages. It took a little while, but Alexandra eventually exposed them. She knew that something was wrong, and she tore them down. And some of the people who were engaged in this stuff, were these were punished, and she wanted to see uh, what the real Russia was. In the middle of 1915, Alexandra collapsed totally from exhaustion. And she was out of commission for a long period of time. Her average sleep every night was about two hours. One of the schools that she had financed entirely with her own personal money was this, with a Society for the Protection of Mothers and Infants. That institution, in turn, financed schools all over the empire and homes all over the empire, especially for those in 1905 where the husbands were killed and the mother and the baby were, were left at home. Um, so ultimately, uh, about 13 million rubles have been raised by the royal family from the noble class. She said that you guys have been pampered for too long. The few nobles that were left 
were very anti-royal, and she forced them to give. If these men are out there protecting you, and you won't give a dime. We will force you to give. And so ultimately, 13 million rubles were raised um, in the first, first two years of World War I. 1915, Tsar Nicholas takes over the command of the army. Every single historian that deals with this issue will say what a terrible joke that is, except for one thing. When Tsar Nicholas takes over, army morale goes through the roof. He's a very popular man. He's right at the front. He's sharing the hardships of the average man. He's not living in luxury. He's living in an ordinary tent. He lives kind of like a, what a second lieutenant would be living in. The German offensive on the Eastern Front ends, and from there on in, they're on the defensive. Nineteen seventeen, eight million Russians are in uniform, fully and totally and completely equipped. The notion of them not having enough equipment is total mythology. Ha however, it is true that the French, um, actually, for all, all the all the combatants, there was it was a big strain because given the size of the war, the number of men under arms and the number of casualties were not expected. Only as our Nicholas predicted. The nature of this war. Russian soldiers were always fully equipped. There was never any exceptions to that rule. Everybody else, however, was not. Because only Tsar Nicholas knew that if a war is going to come, and it was actually Gregory Rasputin, Rasputin had warned him, if you enter into this war, you're never going to come out of it. He's one of the few to tell him that this war will be a disaster. And believe it or not, it's the, it was the Duma that was screaming loudly for this war. The attempts to overthrow Tsar Nicholas came immediately after the victories that occurred subsequent to him taking command uh, on the Eastern Front. That is where uh, the, coup, um, the coup attempts took place. General, the two generals, uh, Ruza and Alexia, began negotiations with the Duma. Right after, and the morale goes to the roof, Tsar Nicholas is the most popular man in Russia. Because there were some papers who actually told the truth about this. That's where the coup attempt, attempt developed. And it was those two men in particular that were going to um, take over. Now, they didn't tell the leader of the Duma that. But the cadet party was the Masonic party. There was no distinction, both in the popular mind as well as the scholarly mind, that the Masonic Lodge ruled that particular party. Given the nature of the press, those elected were not elected based on any platform. The press would act like you know, the royalist candidate was was it was insane, he had sex with his sister, whatever they had to say. And of course the Masonic candidate was was the most wonderful man in the world. This is how they treated campaigns. There were no standards whatsoever. Even 1916, 1917 these two generals, the Duma and the Russian press, were writing false letters and sending false circulars to soldiers on the front saying that the left had taken over the government, the government is collapsing, the war is over. Soldiers were abandoning their posts, not because they were protesting anything, but because that's what they had been told to do. There are numerous copies of these fake letters in existence. The Russian press was big into this. Um, the press would send these circulars out. The left, the Communist Party, groups like this would send out circulars saying, um, uh, uh, it's time to abandon your post, the war's over, the government is disintegrating, or the government has changed hands. And throughout the war, war especially after um, 1915, these forces were sending fake reports, fake, fake circulars and fake letters to the front. Um, saying that you need to abandon your post, the war is over, there's nothing to fight for anymore. Or even more, and this occurred uh, even in civilian areas, that the Tsar has ordered you to leave your post, the war is over. So you had fully equipped Russian soldiers, 8 million by 1917, with very high morale, with an excellent track record on the battlefield, especially since 1915. They were winning. 
And yet you had a movement within the army, you had a movement in the Duma and in the press near the end of the war where um, these fake letters were being, uh, circulars were being sent to the front. Now, the assassination. The murder of Lord Nicholas and his family was um, 98 years ago today. By the way, July 17th was also the day that a number of Jewish physicians around the court murdered um, St. Andre of Lodomir in 1174. So this is also a day um, where another very strong, very successful monarch in Vladimir Suzdal, uh, Bobolubsky, uh, was murdered by his Jewish doctor, and there was a there was a um, a small Jewish conspiracy in his uh, office, along with some nobles, some high level nobles in Vladimir to kill him. So this is meant to be a mirror image. They they chose the same day uh, on purpose. The house where the royal family was sent and then brought to the basement has been studied and pictures taken, even in the Bolshevik uh, era. Now, um, they leave certain uh, traces as to what they meant to do. There is a, a Kabbalistic inscription that says here on the order of the dark forces, the czar was brought to sacrifice or the czar was sacrificed. I'm actually translating this directly as I speak. We are now informing all the nations of this. And then the famous poem by uh, Heine from Germany, Balthazar was killed this evening by his servants. Now they deliberately misspell that. Balthazar is spelled B-E-L-Z-A-T-S-A-R. Czar is the last syllable, T-S-A-R, which is a deliberate misspelling. Balthazar, spelling it that way, also the, 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 the deliberate misspelling also means white king. So the misspelling wasn't just to have the word czar in there, but also to recant the word to have it mean the white king. White meaning pure, white meaning good, white referring to his race, white referring to Hyperborea, the Russian north. And the white king was also a very a positive epithet used by uh, the Russian people. Every member of the team killed the royal family was Jewish. Um, Yurovsky, Safarov, Severdov, of course, and Glushekin. Everyone Jewish. And then there was also an unknown rabbi that knew, numerous um, contemporary sources say got off the train near the house in Katrenberg. Um, a bearded man, clearly a, a Hasidic rabbi. And he was overseeing all this. We don't know what his name is, but it has come up uh, more than once. Uh, and, and people without understanding the, the significance of it had mentioned that they saw this very strange figure uh, coming off train uh, just before um, the, the execution, just before the, uh, the murders. Now, there are two things that haven't been widely reported, even in, even in our circles. Um, the first thing is the drinking of the blood of the murdered royals. Um, and then secondly, that once the um, once the bodies were they were they were had uh, acid dumped on them, first of all, and then for several days they were um, they were burnt. But also before that their heads had been removed and these were sent to Moscow. Uh, to show and you know, preserved and sent to Moscow to um, uh, to prove that that they were dead. Um, they were deliberately dismembered, and no one was allowed to see uh, this process whatsoever. This was only for the insider elite. Um, Severdlov was a high-level mason, and Leon Trotsky was a high-level mason. These kind of ritual ideas are not insignificant in the Bolshevik movement. It also should be noted that the, the bodies were, um, once they became simply nothing but dust, these were then mixed with water and drank by the Bolshevik leadership. 
Um, you have to know how to read Russian to get to these sources. Uh, I'm quite willing to um, uh, share them with you. The one that I'm, I'm using at the moment is um, the shooting of the royal family, a ritual murder. How the royal family um, was was killed, and this is the uh, from the Russian website, um, uh, G E T M A N A T dot org, specializing in um, occult rituals uh, throughout Russian history. So you have the drinking of the blood, the drinking of their remains, or at least a portion of, of their remains once they were reduced to almost nothing. And then, as is better known, the um, sexual molestation of the four girls, both before and after the shootings. This was a human sacrifice. There was tremendous pain involved because the first round of bullets didn't kill anyone. There were sexual assaults going on the entire time. Then they were finished both with bayonets and then eventually with uh, the butts uh, of rifles. So there was no question that those killing were doing so under orders. They used, uh, when they wrote the things that they did, they wrote a very um, a clear, blatant, horizontal line, which refers to passivity. That they are not doing this of their own will, in other words. This was an occult ritual. In Russia, it's mainstream to talk about this as an occult ritual. These the photographs and the writings uh, from the basement of that house, they've been preserved. There was no question the Bolsheviks were going to take over in their minds. And remember, too, the only reason the royal family really needed to be killed, not merely as a human sacrifice, to ensure the victory of the, of the Bolsheviks, but just as important that the Tsar was unpopular. And if he were free and used, the whites were closing in on this part of the country, he would be used as a um, rallying point. If the Tsar is as unpopular as the history books will tell you, then why do they need to be executed? Um, the only reason is because they were a rallying point. The Bolsheviki were a tiny handful of Jewish activists who knew nothing about Russia. Many of them had been brought in from Brooklyn. Many of them didn't even speak Russian. They had no connection with the Russian people at all, and that this was a ritual sacrifice. And the Tsar symbolized Russia. It wasn't just the Tsar and the family being executed, but all of Russia and Russian history is being executed here. This is not some uh, fanciful conspiracy. This is all fairly well documented. And the Bolsheviks maintained uh, the photographs and um, the pictures and, and the, the scrollings on the wall and what they meant. This was not unknown, and this wasn't kept a secret at the time. Obviously, it was not reported in the West, but Russians know about it. And today, it's sort of an old hat concept that everyone talks about. And the, the royal family in Russia is extremely popular. Um, royals under poll in Russia traditionally, uh, like, you know, for the same reason Donald Trump under polls by like 5%. The popularity of the royal house, if you, um, in the restoration of the monarchy in Russia, it takes, you, know, you take, add 10 points to it. And you're talking about a majority of Russian people who would like to see the restoration of the monarchy, but just as much um, have an extremely positive opinion of um, Tsar Nicholas, and the same goes for Belarus and Ukraine. Well, I've run out of time. Um, I, there's much more to say here, but I think I've painted a proper picture of the successes of Tsar Nicholas, the successes of Russia as a nation, and more depressingly, what could have been had Tsar Nicholas not entered that war, and that Russia continued its massive expansion. The blame lies squarely in London and Vienna. It lies with the Masonic Lodge. It lies with the Russian press. Indirectly, it lies with the U.S. and the American press. Reading the Russian press clippings at the time is incredible. They were saying whatever they could to start riots. I guess the press has been doing this for a long time. What could have been? Tsar Nicholas is a great saint in the Orthodox Church. I feel close to him personally, and he really is a symbol, the icon of Russia. And today, we celebrate the memory of the royal family 
We celebrate their murder because, indeed, they are in heaven now. Thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.